This podcast is not safe for work and will feature movie spoilers. It will feature scenes described of a graphic nature. It will contain language which most listeners may find offensive. Welcome to the podcast Under the Stairs. Hi everyone and welcome to the podcast Under the Stairs. I'm your host Duncan McLeish, welcome to the show. Up on this episode we're bringing you a very special interview. This interview is with the creative mastermind behind Onyx the Fortuitous and the Talisman of Souls, about to make its way to digital on demand and Screenbox as of November the 14th, 2023. So we're just around the corner from its release. Andrew Bowser is that man, he'll be joining me after the first break. We conducted about a 20 minute interview, it's all audio because he was in his car, um, so please hang around and check that out, a fun interview and really cool to chat to him about a movie that I saw at the start of the year at Glasgow Fright Fest back in March and it was one of my highlights of the festival and I was a bit kind of trepidatious to come back and check out it on a rewatch because movies seen in a festival tend to have a different viewing than they do when you finally get them on your own. Now, anyone that's been to a horror festival or any sort of festival will know that kind of a festival viewing is a very different experience. You are surrounded by like-minded individuals who all share your similar interests or passions. So as a result of that, the jokes are a little bit funnier, the scares a little bit stronger, and the tension a little bit more palpable. Um, that's just the way that is. And as a result, if you ask me when I come out of a festival, what I score a movie, and then three months later having watched that movie again, what I would score it again. Chances are the festival screening gets a slightly higher score because of atmosphere. Now, I got a screener of Onyx and sat down and watched it just before this interview, and the movie held up. In fact, I actually think I preferred it on the rewatch. I thought the jokes were smarter, I picked up on more of them, and there was a ton of kind of content dotted around in the background I hadn't picked up in the festival setting. So, um, yeah, I, I genuinely think people are going to love this. As horror comedies go, this one feels like it's genuinely made from the heart. In the same way that uh, Tucker and Dale vs. Evil um, comes from the heart. You know what I mean? You, you can feel the love of the writers and actors involved in that project for the genre as a whole. And Andrew is certainly full of that as he has crafted the character of Onyx from the Weird Satanist guy um, over the last 10 years to the big screen and managed to on his journeys get Jeffrey Coleman and Barbara Crampton in on that movie as well. So yeah, 14th of November on digital and at Screenbox if you have a subscription there. Sit back, enjoy, relax. Here's a trailer for the movie and when I return I'm chatting to Andrew Bowser aka Onyx the Fortuitous. Marcus Trilberry can't catch a break. Order up, number 46. At his work, he gets no respect. Um. What, Marcus? I was just wondering if you got my new name tag in yet? Because this says Marquay Dickberry. At his home, he gets no love. I could understand if your father was still in the house, but this is Todd, your stepfather and my lover. Ah. And with his friends, oh, he doesn't have any. But all he needs is a chance. Congratulations! 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 I've been invited to Bartok's mansion to take part in a once in a lifetime ritual in which he, along with five of his most loyal followers, will attempt to raise the spirit of the ancient demon, Abaddon! You're not going anywhere until you scoop that litter box. Now he's off on an adventure. Is the ritual going to work? To the talisman. I'll find the present. The queen. The viking. A werewolf. The witch. And you. 
are the Virgin. What the f When it's the end of the world, a new hero must rise. Patty Slinger? When in doubt, skewer it out. In the Grimoire, after the ritual of Abaddon, there was a warning. Beware the prophecy of the Fortuitous one. What? 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 Marcus Trilberry and the... I'd really love it if you called me Onyx the Fortuitous. Onyx the Fortuitous and the Talisman of Souls. Oh, hey. <laughs> what are y'all doing in here? It's awesome to speak to you. Um, I mean, this is an exciting time for you because since booking this interview with you, we now have an official release date for Onyx the Fortuitous um, on Screenbox and on digital as of the 14th. Um, yeah. This must be the, the most exciting time because I know you've done the festival run. In fact, I caught your movie in Glasgow at Fright Fest. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, which was a ton of fun. But this must be like the culmination of everything now because it's going to be widely available how how are you feeling i feel really good it's funny because every step of the way you're just so focused on what's right in front of you that you don't think about the next step i mean i remember finishing the movie and before i knew it we were sitting at sundance showing it to people and i thought oh right i forgot that you know now we have to show it to an audience and then taking it on the road to go to the other festivals we played uh, I was just shocked every time we showed it to a new audience and how different and exciting it was. And then when we finally released a trailer and that went even wider, I realized, oh, right, there's still more people to see this thing. So this is like the ultimate feeling of that where, oh, I, I just honestly can't wait because it's the kind of movie that I just think people are going to want to share with each other and quote to each other. And so kind of being on the verge of this wider release is, is really exciting for me. Yeah, I think we spent about, me and a group of friends went to Fright Fest and we saw a movie. I think we spent about like a month and a half um, saying notice me senpai <laughs> to each other. Um, on everything. Right. <laughs> like on things that weren't even appropriate. But um, yeah, it's a, it's sure. a hugely, hugely quotable movie. But I think what you've managed to craft um, at its core is something just inherently fun. And it feels like its heart's in the right place. There's a lot of kind of horror comedies that come out that feel almost like a kind of box ticking exercise or they're approached cynically. And I don't want to say it's a pure good, but it did kind of feel like a pure good all the way through it. Was that your intention from the start when kind of transitioning that character who's kind of like an online presence to the big screen was, this has to have heart, has to have soul. Onyx has to be, for the most part, a really likable character. You know, in the very beginning, that wasn't necessarily the intent. I remember sitting down to write whatever this Onyx feature would be in this subgenre. I knew it would be a horror comedy. And I initially pictured a very um, Evil Dead or Evil Dead 2 kind of Onyx at the center of a lot of gory mayhem. Blood spraying up on his face and him having to cope with kind of horror realities. But then as I started writing it, there just wasn't the engine there for that story. And I wasn't sure why. And so I pivoted and I, and I started building out the, the story to involve an ensemble of people that not only that Onyx would care about, but that maybe our audience would care about. And that's when it really took shape. And I realize now that was always what it should be, because that's what the character's been longing for. Even for the years of, of doing him in these viral videos on the Internet, he wants connection, he wants friendship and he wants camaraderie. And so it was interesting that my instincts weren't initially that when ultimately that's what was revealed to me just by kind of listening to the heart of the character. Talk to me a little bit about the casting. So you've obviously, you've done other stuff out with Onyx and you've had an opportunity to work with some legends of the horror genre, specifically Barbara Crampton, Bruce Campbell, but you managed to bring Barbara Crampton in on this one. And then on top of that as well, you managed to get uh, Jeffrey Combs in there as well. So how did the casting of that come? Was that kind of organic or, you know, was that kind of luck or how did it all come together? 
Well, because I had worked with Barbara a couple times before, she was always going to be involved. And I had already told her about the script and we had had even, I think, a coffee date or a lunch date uh, just to kind of keep her updated on how the process was going. And at that point, it was primarily casting that we were focused mm -hmm. on. Um, and then I remember we were having a hard time finding a Bartok, our lead villain. And I had another lunch with Barbara and she said, well, have you, have you thought about Jeffrey? Mm -hmm. And the weird thing is I had thought about him in the sense of, I love Jeffrey Combs and I want to work with him. And he's one of my favorite actors, but I hadn't thought about him for Bartok just because I've always thought that he occupied a similar space to Onyx. Hopefully mm. he wouldn't be offended hearing me say that, <laughs> but just that they're both very scrappy underdogs. I think when Jeffrey has played villainous, he's always the little guy that was pushed too far. Mm -hmm. And I've never seen him as the kind of looming hammer horror villain. Um, although he did do that in uh, Would You Rather and he was fantastic. Mm -hmm. But I just didn't think about him initially. I thought about him playing maybe a uh, a different character in an Onyx sequel. But Barbara said, I really encourage you to think about him in that context, because I think you'll be surprised when you see what he can do with his experience and at his age. And I'm so glad she suggested that. I had one phone call with Jeffrey and I realized he was the one, not only because he was down to kind of play in, in that world, but he just understood the project, understood the tone and was genuinely excited about doing it, which is just invaluable. Yeah, his comedic timing is ridiculous. Um, like, when you consider some of the more serious stuff he's done, but then you also forget, like, especially uh, not averse to wearing makeup. He's done all the Star Trek stuff as well. So, and, like, it is one of those things where I hadn't paid too much attention to the, the cast list before we watched the movie, and it did take about, like, 20 minutes before the penny dropped, and I suddenly realised, oh, it's Jeffrey Combs. Je Je Jeffrey Combs is in this movie. Um, what's, like... What's it like having Barbara Crampton as your mum? Oh, it was fantastic. It was also such a thrill because the day that we shot the uh, the, the scenes at Onyx's house with her as my mother, uh, that was also the day we shot, uh, I guess I should say, to avoid a spoiler, I'll just say mm -hmm. a, a scene that does involve Jeffrey being on set at the same time as, as Barbara. Mm -hmm. And it might feel like they don't share any scenes together in the movie, but they do actually. And uh, having them together playing off each other, it really did make me feel like uh, Stuart Gordon. I felt like, you know, <laughs> Stuart could have been there. And if he were with us, I think he would have had a blast visiting the set. And, uh, and just, I could kind of feel him looking over my shoulder saying, you know, this is fun, right? This is why I worked with these two people so many times because they're a blast to have together. Your um, construction of the movie in terms of the actual effects, like really, kind of captured my attention. In that you went for a, like a hybrid of like practical animatronics as well as the CGI, but the blend is is pretty seamless. It kind of floors me, like having read what the budget for the movie was. How difficult is it as a director and as an actor in a project that has written what he's starring in? to find that balance of, you know, appeasing yourself and the fans who want as much practical as possible. And also at the same time, kind of dealing with a budget that may start to bend a little bit when pushed that way. Well, I think I was lucky in that I had a job for six or seven years as the in-house director at a place called Nerdist, which was uh, a podcast network and a YouTube mm -hmm. channel and an editorial website. And I was their in-house director for all of their sketch, comedy, and branded content. And so every week we might be making uh, a promo video for a Hitman video game, or the next week a video that's a sketch, but it's branded uh, to be about the new Predator movie. And we would sometimes only have two to three weeks to prep and deliver these little mini movies that would kind of jump in genre from week to week. And so me and, and my team got pretty adept at working with that blend and knowing when we had enough time to do something practical versus when we had to not give into it being digital, but kind of let the digital work take over so that a lot of it could be working uh, simultaneously, you mm -hmm. know, so that somebody could be building something out digitally 
while you're also building an element out physically for the set. And yeah, just knowing where that line is, it does come down to budget ultimately. But it also, I'd like to think, especially with indie film, you're kind of always trying to find where to make those decisions uh, where to where it won't necessarily look like it was a signifier of a budgetary decision to the audience. It might look like an intentional creative decision. And so you try to find those moments of where to give and where to bend um, and kind of hide the seams, so to speak. And I think we did that pretty well with Onyx. Uh, I definitely wouldn't have been able to do it if we hadn't had those specific people, those practical puppeteers and those VFX artists, you know, really, really pushed it for a film of this size. And I'm incredibly thankful for all of them. Yeah, it captures this like great like 80s aesthetic, but you've managed to like in terms of the, the neon colors, the animatronics, um, but it has this kind of modern feel as well. When crafting the character of Onyx, who has went through like various different iterations online, um, when, when bringing him finally to the big screen, how much are you playing back on the kind of rich history of those skits, shorts, and kind of viral moments and bringing them in? And how much of that is actually filling out the character with stuff that you maybe hadn't considered on a kind of feature length? Well, interestingly enough, every Onyx video kind of has these little narrative clues to a bigger world. And mm -hmm. I didn't realize that initially, but the very first Onyx video, he says, maybe I'm not Mark who works at Arby's. Maybe I'm Onyx the fortuitous slayer of the Bright Realm. And it seems like a joke. It seems like a an aside with no payoff to look for. But that ultimately becomes the plot of the feature 10 years later is yeah. what if he weren't just a fast food employee what if he was this you know mystical kind of prophet that had been foretold of so it, 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 every video has those moments he talks about his stepdad Todd he talks about wanting to find friends and wanting to not feel alone and so I think it, it interestingly enough I was leaving breadcrumbs I guess for myself to build mm -hmm. out a bigger narrative but it wasn't until I sat down to write the feature uh, did I realize that that those breadcrumbs were there? Um, and then I think it really just became about connecting the dots and then filling in, I think, the lives of the ensemble that I could imagine for them. Obviously not to the extent that I had imagined Onyx's life for 10 years, but I definitely wanted to make sure that it didn't feel like Onyx was the only focus, uh, even just as a writer. I care about these other characters so actually then it made more, I had to take time and fill them out in a way that complemented Onyx, but also made them feel kind of wholly realized. And that was a challenge. And you haven't really stopped either. Like the, the, the kind of beauty of the, the kind of lead up to this viral um, campaign and release is that all these, all, all the advertising work that you're doing in the background and creating kind of like splices of of like real world um and and the character have been a delight do you ever actually switch off from onyx at all or is that kind of is it once the movie's out and you know a larger domain where people can access it that you're able to kind of put that aside and and start working on something else or can you juggle that simultaneously at this point, I can juggle it simultaneously, but I have admittedly been feeling uh, like I want a, a break, but not necessarily yeah. from Onyx, but just from, I love the cycle of production so much that I realize I've kind of purposefully kept myself in it. Um, mm -hmm. It's been like that since I was a kid. I mean, I started off as a kid actor and, uh, and I, I just, when, when we were done a play, I immediately wanted to be in the next play and I wanted to audition for whatever I could to get right back into it. And I realized I've done that with Onyx. I mean, from the, the time we launched the Kickstarter to now, mm -hmm. I really don't think I have stopped yeah. and, and stopped writing, shooting, directing, producing and editing, whether it be the film or like you said, ancillary content to promote the film Mm -hmm. uh, content for the future physical release of the film. Uh, you know, the, uh, there's just, it's been nonstop. And the hard thing I think is that I like it and don't yeah. want to stop. I think what I've been feeling is 
at this age, I need to stop to make sure I can replenish myself and my creative juices for another go round. Yeah. And that's what I've been feeling. But with Onyx, I don't have to take a break from him. He's just kind of always there. I can very easily come up with ideas for him or pitch jokes for him. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't even feel myself putting on the, the wardrobe anymore. It's like I, it's like the Iron Man suit. It just yeah. kind of, <laughs> you know, clings to me, appears out of nowhere, and I'm in it. So, yeah, he's he's ever present. So um, as we're kind of bringing this interview into a close, you kind of opened the door on this question, and I feel like you've probably been asked that a million times, so I do apologize. Uh, but it also means that you'd be really well rehearsed with an answer. Um <laughs> A sequel to Onyx, um, is it on the horizon? Uh, you know, do you have a, a kind of rough charted time scale of when that's likely to be? Or will you be working on something different first and then coming back? Because it's going to be red hot now. So is the urge to kind of strike back in on that while all interest is on the, the character? I definitely have a clear idea for a sequel. And it's it, it was kind of revealed to me at some point while we were editing the first one i realized what was so exciting about this first film was expanding the character and expanding his world and so once we kind of opened that door you know after 10 years of making content for the internet with the character i realized oh but cinematically there's so many places he could go mm -hmm. and i could see him evolving in this such way um, and I've written about half of it, the actual script. I think whether or not it happens definitely will be determined by how many eyeballs we get on this first one. And um, mm -hmm. But I'm going to be making a whole bunch of content to hopefully get eyeballs on this first one, uh, to hopefully get a sequel. Personally, creatively, I would love to do something between the mm -hmm. first Onyx film and an Onyx sequel, um, but not because of any lack of interest on my part, but I just think uh, self-awareness as a creator is important. Mm -hmm. And I think it would be important for audiences and even the industry to see me direct something that I do not act in because ultimately directing is and has been my passion. And Onyx has been, uh, he's an anomaly. He surprised me, really. Uh, I didn't expect him to become a thing. So um, I'd love to direct something that I do not act in uh, and then get back into an Onyx movie. That would be really fun. That's phenomenal. And uh, yeah, I, I, I can't wait to see what comes out next. Andrew, I hope that you have all the success in the world with this movie. I um, I loved it when we saw it at Fright Fest. I was like, like that way where you see something in a festival and you're like, were the festival goggles on? Will this be as funny on you know i watch myself when i'm not surrounded by a theater of people that are like minded i laughed just as hard i actually picked up about a million more details um on the second viewing so i i think it's going to be a movie that's just gonna stay with us for a long long time and um that's a special thing that you've managed to achieve um it is available on screenbox and on digital 14th of november i would be horrifically upset with myself if i didn't ask you to um bring us out of this interview by maybe harnessing a little bit of the power of onyx oh yeah well i guess uh i guess onyx would just say uh yeah my movie comes out on november 14th i don't know stream box is pretty cool <laughs> thank you very much my friend um all the best with your interviews today and uh, i look forward to catching you somewhere down the road Thank you so much. That Fright Fest screening was one of my favorites, just so you know. That was really yeah. wonderful. So Pure I appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks very much. And there you go. Thank you very much to the PR company for setting that up. And a big thanks to Andrew for giving up some of his time. He was, I think he said, double booked, which is why we ended up doing an audio interview as opposed to the video one. But super cool, dude. Really looking forward to seeing where he goes next, where there is a Nonic sequel, which I feel everyone will want or whether he manages to get out there and just do some directing, like he said that he wanted to do. So we'll keep our eyes peeled, and all the best for him on that one. Remember, if you want to check out Onyx and Fortuitous, 14th of November on digital and at Screenbox. If you have a subscription, it will land as part of your subscription. There's a multitude of ways to check out podcasts under the stairs. Wherever you're checking us out right now, subscribe. That way you get the shows as and when they drop, you get access to the entire back catalogue 
of the Tea Putts content if you're checking us through any of the podcatchers out there. If you're checking us out through YouTube, so this video right now, uh, please hit subscribe and leave us a little comment as well. Um, if you're checking us out on Anchor or Spotify, where you also get these as video contents through a podcast platform, there's usually a little question that pops up at the end. Make sure you answer that and also hit subscribe there as well. We have over 1,200 episodes on our RSS feed. We have over 100 episodes now on our YouTube page, so no excuse not to be kept up with the no. So there we are. Thanks once again for checking out this episode. We will be back tomorrow with the first of a four-part series looking at movies from Amicus Productions. Uh, so yeah, lots of anthologies, lots of fun, quirky British horror from the late 60s and early 70s. So until then, wherever you are, what the time zone is and whatever you're up to in this big bad world of ours, please take care of yourselves out there. This is Duncan McLeish broadcasting live from under the stairs and I am signing off. <laughs>